Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm really delighted to welcome Victor Calise, father of dragons, to Access Chat. Um, I won't tell you how Victor and I met because it's very sordid and involves lots of drink. Oh, I did anyway. All right. So we met in Geneva at the ILO um, and we had a great time chatting. Um, and I thought Victor would be a fantastic guest. Uh, Victor, you are the uh, Disability Commissioner for New York City, which is a uh, significant uh, conurbation for a start and no doubt a significant challenge because um, whilst we over this side of the Atlantic think of America as all new and shiny, it's one of your older cities, therefore older infrastructure and, and has lots of challenges. So tell us a bit about the, the role and how you came to be working in the space, please. Sure. Um, I came to be working in the space. I uh, was hurt in a bicycle accident many years ago, and I was an athlete, and playing sports in the streets of New York City was something that I always did. And when I was injured, I became interested in playing sports, and I made the Paralympic team in 1998 in the sport of sled hockey. And I was involved in everything New York City had. And the New York City was bidding for the NYC 2012 Olympic and Paralympic bid, which you won, right, Neil? Um, yep, 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 you beat Personally, us out on that. Of course, yes. Yep. And through that process, I got involved uh, with, uh, with the International Olympic Committee, the United States Olympic Committee, and we had meetings throughout New York City, and I happened to sit next to the Parks Commissioner that was there at the time, Adrian Benepe, and I told him, we need to make parks accessible for people with disabilities um, so we can participate in sport. And uh, lo and behold, I worked with them a little bit, was recruited over to parks and got involved in making our park system accessible. And I would argue today um, that New York City is the most accessible park system in the world. We have over three, um, 30,000 acres of parks, uh, 565 large parks and small parks, thousands of playgrounds, uh, 658 bathrooms, I know that because uh, we need them. And uh, we just go throughout the city finding and coming up with a plan for accessibility. And our design and construction today really goes over and beyond our ADA codes and standards. Nonetheless, um, just a little plug for our park system. Um, uh, the role at the mayor's office for people with disabilities opened up. Uh, because of uh, the late commissioner, uh, Commissioner Saplin had passed away, uh, who was doing a great job, and I was pulled into the role. And I've um, been fortunate enough to serve under two administrations, both uh, the Bloomberg administration and now the de Blasio administration, where we've championed a lot of accessibility issues. And our office is basically a referral-based office, and we connect people with resources to a city government, because what the city of New York offers anyone it, under Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act has to offer the same thing for people with disabilities. And we work across city agencies to do that. And uh, we have uh, direct, um, direct service programs, uh, mainly um, our Project Open House, which goes into people's houses uh, and makes remediations to make them accessible. And our NYC of Work initiative, which is our key initiative, um, it's a public-private partnership to employ people with disabilities throughout the city of New York. Um, and you can find a lot of this stuff on our website at uh, myc.gov slash accessible NYC. Fantastic. And um, I know Deborah's got a question, but before I, I, I hand over to Deborah, um, you know, that public-private partnership you were just talking about, that's finding people jobs in NYC or in NYC, the, the, yeah. the local government, is it? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll oh, let me, it's a yeah. combination of all of that. So okay. it's a public-private part, partnership funded by the Poses Family Foundation, the Kessler Foundation, Institute for Career Development, and um, our state agency, Access VR, which is vocational. And um, there's, the way it is, is there's, we built the Business Development Council with businesses throughout, uh, High growth sector such as tech, finance, health and hospitals, um, um, retail, hotel management, 
um, and city government. Uh, so, and we have close to 100 businesses and top names uh, that are out there that we work with. And then there's the service providers as the Goodwills and uh, AHRC and and uh, city government and the, that plays a role in that as well. Um, and these service providers um, work uh, where the talent is, right? So it's actually building by demand side, uh, where are the jobs with the businesses, where is the talent with the service providers, and we as the mayor's office with people with disabilities are connecting all of that together to employ people with disabilities in those sectors, uh, as I mentioned, as well as city government. Deborah, over to you. Yeah, thank you. And, and Victor, welcome to the show. I also, I had met you before just briefly, but I also got to know you better um, in Geneva at the um, the ILO Global Business Disability Network, which really was an amazing event. So yes, kudos to that entire team. Yeah. But I, I, one thing that I love about the work, there's so much I love about the work that you are doing in New York City, and, um, but I like that you're collaborating, you're collaborating with the community, you're collaborating with the disability-owned organizations, with the disability organizations, with the foundations, with the, your, one thing that I think is really going well in New York City is that you are collaborating with so many others, and you're looking at it from so many different lenses, like I know you're very heavily involved in the smart city conversations, um, along with G3ICT, and and you were on a panel with you know Karen in Chicago and the group in LA, and so you're sharing what you're doing in the in New York City as well. You're into financial literacy for people with disabilities. It's just very very exciting all the different moving parts. You're, you're really committed to making sure transportation, the subway systems, everything is fully accessible to people with disabilities. And I, of course, also love that you yourself understand because you, you, you are a wheelchair user. But I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just stepping back um, one step because you were telling us a story in Geneva that just really impressed me and you were talking about your career before you got injured and you talked about that career and I think you should talk about it if you don't mind what you did and why yeah. you loved what you did and how it changed your life and after the accident you took I mean you were very content with the life you had and then and then the world said well no Victor why don't you try living your life this way and taking what you had built and who are you now and where are you going and leading into one of the most successful programs in the United States, I just think is a very powerful story. So I'm going to shut well, up and let you talk. <laughs> well, Deborah, thank you for all the kind words. Um, but the reality is I, I couldn't get it done without the talented people that I have in my office, um, from my deputy commissioner to my assistant commissioner who helped me drive initiative to to the people that are working in transportation in my office and housing and I mean the, the list goes on and I'm only as good as the people that are behind me so I just want to recognize that and I can't do it without them. my assistant uh, who, who was amazing as well I can, I can go on and on but the reality is that uh, in order to make things work you have to look across a lot of stuff right and then you talked about the collaboration and that's important but before I get there uh, I want. I'll go back to your original question of where I came from. I am a, um, a, a grandson of immigrants, and they came to this country and they worked really hard, and uh, they paved the way for us. My family is a, my Italian heritage to to, be, to have a place in in the greatest city in the world. And my father, I come from a long line of blue collar workers. My father worked for the Mass Transit Authority, which is a transportation organization here in New York City that provides all public transportation. Um, my grandfather was a mechanic and and that was my path. And I went to school, Thomas Edison High School, for um, a degree uh, or knowledge and, and, and hands-on work to become a plumber. And I was a successful plumber for a good amount of my younger life. And I was about two years away from getting my plumber, plumbing license and uh, Plumbers make a, a good living, backbreaking, but uh, blue collar work and really vested in that. And uh, that's what I was and I was content and I was going forward to getting my license and I would have had my own business and working uh, and doing great things. 
um, in the plumbing, in the plumbing world, in the blue collar world, which I'm still connected to in a lot of different ways today. Um, so yeah, that's where I started and then I was injured and my world got turned upside down and I found things that would work for me. And that was to go back to school and get a degree in something that I was interested in. And that happened to be sports management. Because I, as I mentioned earlier to Neil, growing up playing sports in the city of, on the streets of New York and uh, every way and any way that I can. And yeah, and then one thing led to another and uh, lo and behold into the sports world and working in adaptive sports under an organization called United Spinal Association, uh, formerly Eastern Paralyzed Veterans Association, now United Spinal Association. I learned how to advocate there. Uh, and that advocacy led me to sports and then here in the mayor's office. So it's it's been an interesting ride and it's been fun. And, uh, you know, I've got another couple of years left here um, and I'm kind of going to see what's next. It's, it's really exciting. And I know that I need to turn the mic over to Antonio, but I just want to tell one quick story that was a shocking story to me. So as we mentioned, we uh -oh. were in Geneva. Yeah, yes, because you were a very bad boy. We were in Geneva and we were at the International Labor Organization, part of the United Nations. And there was a small group of us and we were walking towards the exit. And Victor's in a wheelchair and he gets on. We're looking for the elevator. Yeah, yeah, Victor. We're I looking for that. the elevator. I didn't. And as a matter of fact, I think I have this. I, I got to see if I have a video of it. But we were looking for the elevator because Victor is in a wheelchair. And so he's not going to go down the escalator. So what he does is he actually gets on the escalator backwards and he's holding on. And we're like going, no, 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 we'll find the elevator. And then all of a sudden he starts screaming and he goes backwards. And there were people around that are freaking out. And Mr. Smart Alec was in his wheelchair and, and it, everybody stopped and he got a crowd. And then this one woman working at the UN's like, do it again so I can visit you. But it was, it was horrifying and hysterically funny. So I uh, just wanted to say that uh, and I'll give you to, you know, let you defend yourself and then turn it over to Antonio. But, it, you know, we can have fun. We can have fun too. Well, you mentioned something before. Yes, I am a wheelchair user. But when we're thinking about advocacy here in New York City and what we do out of the mayor's office, we really got to think broadly. And I just want to put that out there, right? When we're looking at people, um, people with visual disabilities, low vision, uh, blind and low vision, we're looking at people who are deaf and hard of hearing, cognitive disabilities, learning disabilities, brain injuries, um, physical disabilities. And, and we make sure that we encompass all of that. And yeah, you're right. People with disabilities have a lot of fun. And in New York City, things don't seem to work well. So you have to find different ways to get downstairs or escalators. And and unfortunately, uh, those things exist. And I think that's anywhere around the world. And I just like to be versatile and being able to get out of situations. So um, yes, it was funny, but uh, it, it it is a tool for me to, to get around. Funny you bring that up, Deborah. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I thought we had lost you when you were going yeah. over the escalator, but um, let me turn it over to Antonio. But then I realized you're just a smart aleck, and I appreciated yeah. you even more. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I follow um, um, almost every event focused on, on, on smart cities, wherever it happens from uh, all over the world, and, and, and see how these different conferences are being set up. Some of them are completely focused on technology, that technology will drive change and will make a city smart and put, putting humans as a, some kind of a kind of a accessory behind. Um, others are more focused on the human side and realize that you can't really make a smart city if the city is not useful for people. Um, uh, last year, I was talking with someone from the Dublin City Council and he, he was telling me, you know, Antonio, one of the things that I struggle is, is how I'm going to tell planners that making uh, an area accessible is more important than them winning an award. Because sometimes they are so focused on the award that they then they build something that is not accessible. So my question to you, Victor, is how do you bring everyone to the table 
to make sure that when you are planning, when you are putting something together, when you are developing a new site, or when you are changing, even you know, let's say a new bid, a new bid for mobility or public transport within the city, how you make sure that everyone understands how important accessibility is. So we here in America are very lucky in a lot of ways because our laws dictate, right? Um, the ADA is a civil rights law, uh, which means it's rooted in law, which means that we have standards. Um, and, and, and if you don't follow the standards, people can get sued. And there's a lot of suing going on because people don't pay attention to accessibility. But um, it's written in our law. Uh, Title II, uh, Title III of the RADA is important, and it talks about uh, construction. But we also have guidelines that we have to follow. And those guidelines are built in architecture architects training um, of the ADA and they have to they have to do that so that's one piece but there's often times where it's not good enough right the ADA the our ADA guidelines are the floor not the ceiling so in New York City we have committed everywhere we can to go over and beyond accessibility i mentioned our park system um, earlier well, um, I worked in the parts department and work with their capital division in all new construction jobs. And the things that are coming out of there go over and beyond accessibility, more ground level play equipment that they have to, moving through the space, right? Not just building one ramp, but building ramps on each side so people with disabilities can actually get from one side to the other, just like anyone else. And it's not just for kids with disabilities, right? It's for kids with, it, it's for parents and grandparents that may have a disability that want to participate in that. So we have to look at that totality, right? And say everyone has to be included because accessibility benefits everyone. Um, so a good, the parts department is one example, and I could talk on days for that, but there's other ways that we affect things. Um, we have, um, looking, we just, we talked about transportation. So. Uh, we built new subway systems, and that was really rooted in ADA, so all the accessibility standards were there. And then recently, we, the city of New York, put together a citywide ferry system. And that ferry system, we were involved in from the get-go, from the beginning, to ensure that accessibility was there from, from the curb making sure that uh, the path of travel was accessible, making sure when they get to that kiosk, that that kiosk is accessible so pe people can buy their tickets um, from that kiosk, making sure when they enter the boat it's accessible, and going over and beyond, looking at ways to put effective communication in there, um, looking at ways to make sure that bathrooms are there because the ADA said uh, has some type of uh, rules. We wanted to make sure that our bathrooms were accessible to everybody. So we kind of look at things uh, from different perspectives, get all the players in the room, talk about accessibility, where our obligation is, and when we plan to go over and beyond. And we also have, uh, what we've done is to, in New York City has about 50 agencies, uh, 50 plus agencies. And we wanted to make sure that every agency throughout the city is doing what they're supposed to, making sure that their programs and services and the design and construction they deliver are accessible for people with disabilities. So. We're one office, we're 30 people in one office. How are we gonna to get to all agencies? It's virtually impossible. But what we what happened was there was a local law that said that there needs to be disability service facilitators in agencies across the city. So that gave us the ability to make sure that we find people with disabilities to fill those jobs or uh, representatives from the disabled community to fill those jobs, making sure that we do the proper training for each and every every one of those disability service facilitators, making sure they become ADA coordinators, teaching them what uh, reasonable accommodation is, what effective communication is, how to hold an accessible event. So we do all that training here. And what that does is it gives us an extension of our staff, but more importantly, it allows people to contact a disability service facilitator for any request they, they need. So you can go to our website and go to nyc.gov. Uh, um, slash accessibility, 
and you should be able to find a disability service facilitator in agencies across the city. And we're really proud of that, that work that we do there. So uh, when you let's say, when you are have the the opportunity to to meet people who are in a similar role at yours in different parts of the world, uh, is there any type of question that they, they often ask you? you no, know, uh, you no, know, they might know how you guys do this in New York. And what challenges you have? Is there any conversation happening? And if yes, uh, what? challenge do you see other people might have in, in other cities around the world on that matter? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to come to the U.S. first and then I'll talk a little bit more globally. We have, uh, there are other offices like this that exist, the mayor's office with people with disabilities that exist throughout the country. And we wanted to ensure that we meet. So we've met on phone calls for many years talking about the challenges that we have in cities and uh, why, what we're doing and how we're doing it and how we tackle things. So that was a, built a network. And uh, Chicago's mayor's office really led that initiative for many years. And I was like, this is insane that we've never had the opportunity to meet. And we were going to meet under the last presidential um, uh, administration, but we never had an opportunity to. So we um, luckily have someone that is invested in the city of New York, which is city, um, city community development, which was Citibank. Uh, and they invested in our Empowered NYC program, which is a financial empowerment program, which we could hopefully get to later. And they helped convene a meeting of all the MOPD commissioners here in the United States. And that led to bigger initiatives and um, which has been amazing. And um, those cities, we, we now have an Empowered Cities Initiative with five cities across the United States, uh, sponsored by city. And it is uh, to look at financial empowerment, housing, um, and, and work, because they're all, they all tie together. So those, that network that we built, um, and that's five, the five cities I mentioned with Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, um, LA and New York City and Boston, excuse me, I missed that. So those, the, those cities are really tied together. And we've actually taken uh, two, uh, two of those commissioners last year at Access Israel's conference, uh, met there to talk about the initiatives that we're pushing forward. So building those networks and understanding what's out in the world um, is something that I like to do. Um, why I was at the ILO, to really talk about the work that we're doing on employment, but also to connect with other people and let them know what we're doing. And people ask us, you know, how do you do it? And, and then I talk about an agenda. Uh, we have something called Accessible NYC, and it, it, it touches on seven areas, transportation, healthcare, education, um, employment, financial empowerment, technology, and everything the city has to offer. So, uh, so, and education as well. So there's eight pillars on that. And we really focus and drill down on that and how we deliver that. And I can give prime examples on each and every one of them. So when I talk with cities, they're interested, uh, cities around the world, they're interested in what's happening. And I tell them what we've done. And I also listen because other people are doing great things across. And I, and I, I hate to say it, but if I see something in another city, I'm going to bring it back here because you know, I'm going to steal it or, or just use it because those we really have to share that knowledge across each city. Um, we've done um, smart city technology things with the city of Barcelona. And so we're always looking to partner with other cities around the world, learning from other cities, talking about the good th things we're doing and making sure that we collaborate in every way we can, which has led me to um, access chat here. Fantastic. Uh I remember where my mute button was. That's brilliant. So um, I'm I'm really interested um, in all of that stuff, and I know you don't want to talk about the the other thing as well. Just wheeling backwards for a moment, um, when we're thinking you know, thinking about infrastructure, and you, you know, Deborah talked you know, about the fun you had with your your wheelchair. When we have this legacy of infrastructure which is not fully accessible. Um, 
and we can't destroy everything because we care about our heritage and sometimes it's retrofitting is imperfect um and also we can't boil the ocean there are maybe things that you still can't access using a wheelchair and i've seen a lot of debates online recently about things like exoskeletons and exoskeletons allow people to access things that are currently inaccessible uh, and and some of the debate is well hell they should just make everything accessible ramp the bloody thing um and and other other people are saying well you know we don't like them because you know they're they're saying things like well you know you know talking eye to eye is assuming that that's the only way people want to talk and everything else where do you stand with this kind of you know, with with things like exoskeletons, do you think there's a a place for this kind of new technology that's coming in, or do you think that it is, as some people are saying, you know, an excuse for people to not make any accommodations because they're kind of saying, well, you know, what you can get this really expensive technology and you can just, you know, live in our ableist designed world, you know? Well, yeah, it's very interesting, right? Um... Disability is a part of life, and we we have to get used to that. And I'm proud of my disability, and and I think it's it's important to take technology and bring it to another le a level, right? Technology enables everybody, regardless if you have a disability or not. Um, then and, and right, if you have a disability and you use an app, and someone else uses the app too, right? that helps them get to whatever they need, right? To the means to the end, whatever that may be. So if people choose to have exoskeleton, that's their choice, right? But it's not for everyone. Um, I thought exoskeleton was would be great, but you know what? It's, it, to me, it's a lot of work. And, but I can understand how people want to stand and do things, but that's, that's a person's personal choice. You can't replace accessibility accessibility is there and it should be there we should find every possible way to make everything that we can accessible um and there shouldn't be an excuse for that um yeah money's a factor you know what in in smart design money is never a factor um and hey if you're worried about making your storefront um, accessible for people with disabilities think about what it would do for your revenue if you made it accessible Right. There's an increase in revenue if you make your place accessible. It's an increase in getting your deliveries in, for God's sakes. Right. And then it, it crosses over to people who are aging and the most coveted people that everyone wants is parents with strollers. Right. Um, and that's just on the physical axis. But but on the other. Um, but there's other access that you need as well. So we, but we really have to. Accessibility. Is important for everyone. It needs to be there. Um, there's no replacement for it. And, and, and if you think about it, Neil, right? If you think about the cost of an exoskeleton, right? Only certain people will be able to get that. You're not going to get a certain population in there that, because they don't have the means to do that. Accessibility bridges that gap. And, um, I, I'm not for saying, hey, don't use an exoskeleton. I get why people may want to do that, but it's not for me. Um, and we, and if we're going to put technology, it has to really cross everybody, right? Everyone that needs yeah. it. And, and, that, and that's a cost factor. And we're not going to get there in that. And exoskeletons aren't for everybody. Accessibility in, in that grand scheme of it all is cheaper. Um, yeah, you do have some challenges in making older buildings accessible. And there are ways to do it and creative ways to do it. Um, inclusive design is smart design, period. Yeah, I, I I certainly was playing devil's advocate in in, yeah. in in my question. So, um, but I am interested in the in the because there is there are definitely two camps in the views about you know whether or not exoskeletons are a good thing or just a projection of able-bodied people's idea of what people with disabilities want. You know, um, so so it, it's I, interesting. I think it will always be there, right, Neil? Um, yeah. Because I think I remember when I was first injured, right? The the I the idea of being in a walking world, not being in a walking world, scared me. But as time goes on, and you learn and you accept, 
of what reality is and you realize that you know what my quality of life is really important what do i want do i want to walk on leg braces um that aren't conducive for me to get to point a to point b in a quick way no i didn't i personally didn't want that but some people may and i can't tell other people what to do but i can fight for accessibility where it needs to be um throughout everything we do because it's important absolutely Deborah, you had a comment? I did. Um, and I, I want to go back a little bit to when you were talking about City. And I um, am a big fan of City and the work that they're doing. And um, I had them on my other show, Human Potential at Work, talking about the financial literacy, which the New York City Mayor's Office got behind and supported. And I just think that not only is that something we need for people with disabilities, but we need it for all Americans. And so um, I really, really like the programs that City is doing and how they're supporting the mayor's office and everything you're doing. I will also give them a shout out because we had the wonderful Dr. Caroline Casey on the show last week, and she's in Davos this week. Yay. And City is one of the signers. So the CEO of City stood up and said, well, of course we're going to do this. But I was just wondering, are, are there other corporations? Because I know there are. But what other corporations are really getting behind and supporting what you're doing in New York City? Because one thing that I've nagged and complained about is that I want to see U.S. corporations standing up and doing more globally and really showing global leadership. And um, I think one easy way they can tell us they care about us is to join the Valuable 500, especially when the Valuable 500 is going to close in September 2020. And it's going to be the Valuable 500. So we want 501, 502. But if you want to be 500, it's time to do it, especially because I believe um, they have 237 within a year, which is shocking and amazing, companies that have signed up, another 250 in queue. So I was just curious if you could talk a little bit, are other corporations really supporting what you are doing? What do you suggest to corporations to get more engaged? How can corporations help what you are doing in New York City? And then once again, how do we do the brilliance that you are doing in New York City and, how, and, and let it roll out to help other cities, not just our big, wonderful cities in Boston and Chicago and LA, but what about you know, our smaller, our mediums, our Richmonds, our, you know, you know, our Charlottes, our, our tiny towns. So I, I know that's a big, big question, but. Yeah, it, it is a big question. Now we have, uh, we have organizations, um, companies that have, have signed on and of doing some great work with us and mainly in the area of employment. Um, Uniglo happens to be hiring people with disabilities, BNP Paribas Standard Charter, um, JetBlue. I mean, in the, these are organizations that we've, financial institutions um, that we've been working with, the Marriott. Yeah. I mean, there are area, places that we've been working with corporations, right? The valuable 500 is important, right? We need to have that conversation. They need to be, uh, they need to stand up and not just talk about uh, the people we have working for them, but what's next into the future. How do we get a new, new blood of people with disabilities employed? Um, employment is a big issue. 79% of people with disabilities from the working age of of 16 to, to 64 jobless in New York City, 79%. And what what is it? You know, we got a, jo a jobless rate four per, less than 4% right now, right? But for people with disabilities, it's that that high? It, it, no, it can't happen. We need to hire people with disabilities. That's how come we put together NYC at work. Um, and it's been it's been great. Um, the we've had people that have funded our uh, our I Bill IT lab, which um, is a um, is a cybersecurity um, training program for people with disabilities funded by Institute for Career Development and um, the Butler Foundation, uh, BNP Paribas Standard Charter. And people have invested into this program where we get people trained in cybersecurity um, and come out with a Cisco certification that leads to an internship with a path to employment. Those are the type of real things that we need companies. Um, people to invest in um, because people with disabilities have talent and they should be involved in the workplace. And the efforts that we've had across um, across the city and uh, we're strategically placed um, here in New York City to have those corporations and those uh, corporate offices here that we're able to exercise. And sure, we're going to be looking at the valuable 500 
after this and going after those companies that are based here in New York City and saying, hey, you signed on. It's time, it's time to be working with us because we have the programs in place to be able to employ people with disabilities throughout our city. No, no, uh, uh, and if, if you have the chance, you know, share with us some of those links, particularly the one in cybersecurity, because you know, there's a, a huge demand in, the, in that space. Everyone is complaining that there's not enough talent out there and not enough people filling the jobs in cybersecurity. So it's really refreshing to see that type of training taking place and especially helping people with disabilities to get more opportunities to employment. Yeah, it, it's really important. myc.gov slash MOPD, myc.gov slash accessible myc. You can read about all the initiatives that are there. I mean, these are, these are real real things and real programs that are in place that we really are making a difference. And uh, we, we, we post our yearly report, Accessible NYC. It's easy to look at. You can find all the information in there. Again, it's nyc.gov slash Accessible NYC. Thank you. That's fantastic. So, Victor, it's been a true pleasure. Oh, we're done? <laughs> yes. Well, until next time, well, you can always come back. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, especially if you have big news and and you know earth-shattering news or anything like that, you'd of course be welcome back. But we, yeah, we we roll for half an hour. It's taken us to the point where we have to say thank you very much to the people that support us, Barclays, Microlink, MyClearTex, uh, for all of the efforts and genuine support that we get to keep us rolling for the last five years and keep spreading the good word about what people like yourself are doing and look forward to you joining us on Tuesday on Twitter and uh, feeling the love of the community. Thank you, Victor. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Uh, take care. Thanks for having me.